Before we get started, I want to remind you that one of the best ways you can support Read Japanese Literature is by joining us as a Patreon supporter. You can visit patreon.com slash read Japanese literature right now and get bonus content for this episode, including more about the childhood stories that inspired Hayao Miyazaki, Miyazaki's relationship with his family and his pre-Ghibli career, dark fan theories about My Neighbor Totoro, and what it was like to view My Neighbor Totoro and the Grave of the Fireflies as a double feature. Really? Supporters also get early access to each new episode. So please think about supporting us, not just the podcast, but our website, transcripts, and book list. Our work is helping readers, students, and teachers in places all over the world. You can help too. Patreon.com slash read Japanese literature. This is Read Japanese Literature. My name is Allison Fincher. Read Japanese Literature is a podcast about Japanese fiction and some of its best works. All the works we discuss are available in translation, so you can read along if you want. You can find out more at readjapaneseliterature.com. First, I want to say a big thank you. Last week, in November 2023, Read Japanese Literature hit a big landmark, 25,000 total episode downloads. I'm really proud to be supporting the global community of people who love Japanese literature. Thank you for being a part of it. This is a special time for a subset of people living outside of Japan who love Japanese culture. We're finally getting access to the latest film by that paragon of Japanese animation, Hayao Miyazaki, and his animation studio, Studio Ghibli. In English, the film is called The Boy and the Heron. It's out a little earlier in the U.S. than in the U.K. Sorry about that to some other English-speaking listeners. Some European listeners have had access for a month or so. The rest should get access by the end of January. I am, obviously, part of the subset of Japanese culture lovers who also love Miyazaki's work. And so to celebrate, Read Japanese Literature is taking a look at the storytelling of the great animation master. Why is this still literature? Because Miyazaki's stories haven't been created in a vacuum. They come from Japanese books, European books, American books, and even when they come from Miyazaki's own imagination— There are clear inspirations from tales told by other people. So that's what we're looking at today, the stories of Hayao Miyazaki and Studio Ghibli. We'll start with the biography of the man and the studio. I'll explain why both in just a minute. We'll move on to those stories, and we'll finish with a look at Aiko Kadono's novel, Kiki's Delivery Service, the source text for Studio Ghibli's first major success. For people who aren't big Ghibli fans, I'm going to try to provide enough context that you can follow what's going on and hopefully still learn something important about some of the most popular stories in Japanese culture today. to weave together the biography of Hayao Miyazaki with the tale of Studio Ghibli. And I'm taking this approach for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want to be redundant. There's significant overlap. Two, I can't tell the story of one without the other. And three, while the best known and best beloved films out of Studio Ghibli have been the ones directed by Hayao Miyazaki, they aren't only his work alone. There are other people whose work has been hugely important to the studio, most notably the work of co-founders, director Isao Takahata and producer Toshio Suzuki, and of course, even less influential people, down to the guy who brings the animators their coffee, deserve credit for their contributions too. I'm relying a lot today on the work of Susan Napier at Tufts University in Massachusetts, namely her book, Miyazaki World, A Life in Art. 
It's a great resource, an accessible scholarly work in English that weaves together Miyazaki's biography with his body of work. But as always, I'll be bringing in a lot of resources as well as my own reading and watching of primary sources. And as always, I'll cite my sources in the bibliography that you can find on the episode page. Hayao Miyazaki was born on January 4, 1941 in Tokyo. This means he was born several years into Japan's Pacific War, a little less than a year before Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor and Japan's declaration of war on the United States. The Miyazaki family fared better than many other Japanese people during the war. Hayao's father and uncle owned a factory that made parts for Japan's iconic warplanes, the Mitsubishi Zeros. Among other wartime roles, the Zeros were instrumental in the attack against Pearl Harbor. But Miyazaki seems to feel guilty about his family's relative wealth and a time of severe deprivation for almost everyone else. He spent 1944 to 1946 living on his grandfather's estate while many other people in Japan were starving to death. Susan Napier relates several of Miyazaki's most persistent motifs to his childhood, the horrors of war, environmental devastation, mothers and powerful women. You can see powerful women in many of Miyazaki's stories. Sometimes they're morally ambivalent, sometimes they're the protagonist, sometimes they're on the protagonist's side. Miyazaki's mother, Yoshiko, was diagnosed with spinal tuberculosis, also known as Pott's disease, in 1947. Spinal tuberculosis occurs when tuberculosis bacteria, usually from the lungs, infect the spine and cause the tissue between vertebrae to die and collapse. Yoshiko actually recovered thanks to antibiotics that had been developed in the 1940s and lived until 1983. She died at 72 years old. But young Miyazaki's fear for his mother's life left a strong impression. Miyazaki and his mother weren't especially affectionate, but Miyazaki highly respected his intelligent, flashy, and tough-minded parent. Hayao Miyazaki began to dream of life as a mangaka, as a manga artist, at least as early as junior high school. Precursors of manga had been around for more than a century. Something that looks more like modern manga had developed in the magazines of the Taisho era that we've talked so much about. But there was an explosion of manga in the post-war period. Miyazaki was a fan of a lot of the most popular mangaka and their manga. Osamu Tezuka's Astro Boy is almost certainly the best known of these 1950s manga in English. Miyazaki thought his interests in manga made him kind of a dork. He said, quote, I was probably the only guy I knew in high school who actually read manga. If I'd told people then that I also drew comics, they would have treated me as though I were an idiot. Miyazaki also took oil painting lessons and he read a lot. He continued to sketch and begin his own manga stories, never finish them, throughout high school and college. Miyazaki graduated from Gakushuen University in 1963 with degrees in political science and economics. But his first job was at toy animation. Miyazaki says his real schooling was at toy animation. He started as what's called an in-betweener. An in-betweener is an animator who does the grunt work of drawing the more boring individual moving pictures between the most important images drawn by the main animator. A year later, in 1965, he married his wife, Akemi Ota, who was also an animator at Toei. Their son, Goro, was born in 1967, followed by another son, Keisuke, in 1969. Just four years after beginning his career as an animator, Miyazaki was working as a chief animator, concept artist, and scene designer on a project called The Great Adventure of Horus, Prince of the Sun. The film was important for a lot of reasons, 
but for our purposes today, it is important because it marks the beginning of Miyazaki's working relationship with Isao Takahata. Takahata would eventually co-found Studio Ghibli with Miyazaki. Isao Takahata was born in 1935. That makes him six years older than Miyazaki. He came from more modest means. When he was growing up, his father was a junior high school principal. Like Miyazaki, his education has nothing to do with animation or even art. His degree from the University of Tokyo is in French literature. But unlike Miyazaki, Takahata wasn't interested in animation itself. He wanted to write and direct. The Great Adventure of Horus was his directorial debut. The movie is regarded as one of the most important works of modern Japanese animation, but it was a box office flop. Takahata was demoted, and the perceived failure put a serious damper on his future at Toei. By 1971, Takahata and Miyazaki left Toei Animation. The next decade of Miyazaki and Takahata's careers, that is, the decade before the founding of Studio Ghibli, is a little fragmented, but I want to mention a few key projects. The two men attempted to develop a film based on Swedish author Astrid Lindgren's Pippi Longstocking. I'll never forget that she's Swedish again. They were never able to get the author's permission. Takahata and Miyazaki co-directed episodes of an anime based on the popular Lupin the Third manga series about a European master thief. It's a kind of James Bond-esque blend of sex and sophisticated skill based loosely on an early 20th century detective story series by French writer Marie Leblanc. And then Miyazaki made his directorial debut with Castle of Cagliostro, starring the same hero. Miyazaki's mentor, the animator Yasuo Otsuka, was responsible for the decision to recruit Miyazaki. Otsuka is quoted as saying, Yes, I thought, thanking heaven, if Miyazaki came on board, this couldn't fail to be entertaining anime. According to Susan Napier, Otsuka recruited Miyazaki already fully aware of Miyazaki's, quote, tendency to shape material to his own purposes. We'll talk more about that tendency to shape material as we continue. Not everyone was happy with the family-friendly result of Miyazaki's shaping this Bond-esque character to his own purposes. An Otaku USA critic said the result was like watching, quote, a James Bond movie where Bond stayed at a Motel 6 and his Bond mobile was a Toyota Camry. I, for one, really enjoyed the film, as did my children. The 1984 film Nausicaa Valley of the Wind is often lumped in with Studio Ghibli films. It's not. It was made with the assistance of other animation studios, including Toei. I think it gets grouped with Ghibli because most of the Studio Ghibli team had been assembled and worked together on the film. Producer Takahata, director Miyazaki, and now, for the first time, composer Joy Hisaishi, who went on to compose the music for every subsequent film directed by Miyazaki. But it was Nausicaa's success that made Studio Ghibli possible. By 1985, Hayao Miyazaki, Toshio Suzuki, and Isao Takahata co-founded Studio Ghibli. By the way, in case you're wondering, Ghibli is an Italian word from a Libyan term for a hot desert wind. The men wanted to blow a new wind through Japan's animation industry, and they have. Today, it's hard to overstate the importance of Studio Ghibli. Of the top 25 highest grossing films of all time in Japan, five are from Studio Ghibli. Three Studio Ghibli films break the top 10. And I'm not talking the top 25 highest grossing animated films. I'm talking about the top 25 highest grossing films, period. But the studio's first film, Castle in the Sky, was a relative flop. So was its double feature second attempt, My Neighbor Totoro, paired with Grave of the Fireflies. Oof, right? The studio's first success came with 1989's Kiki's Delivery Service, followed by a number of films with varying levels of success. 
It was 1997's Princess Mononoke that began a series of remarkable successes, not only at home, but also abroad. And then 2001's Spirited Away changed the game for foreign animation and won an American Academy Award. A more thorough summary of the almost 40-year history of Studio Ghibli is a little outside of our scope for today, especially because we're going to cover some of the films in more depth in just a minute. 82-year-old Hayao Miyazaki isn't ready to retire. Miyazaki claimed he was stepping away from Ghibli after Princess Mononoke in 1997, and after Spirited Away in 2001, and after Ponyo in 2013. Now the Ghibli vice president has told reporters on his behalf that Miyazaki, quote, shows the willingness to create something new. There are even rumors that he is already working on a new project, which could mean anything from a short film for the popular Studio Ghibli Museum to a new feature-length animated film. And now we get to the literature. In this section of the episode, I want to explore different kinds of sources for Studio Ghibli's movies. Japanese manga, which I know read Japanese literature doesn't normally cover, Japanese stories and prose, Western children's stories and prose, and original stories from Miyazaki's mind. I'll zoom in a little bit on one example from each category to look at how members of Studio Ghibli developed that story into an animated film. I'm going to start with stories from manga because that is the most productive source of stories for Studio Ghibli. Eight of Studio Ghibli's films are based on manga. Miyazaki's only films from manga actually come from manga that the director wrote himself. I've already mentioned Miyazaki's lifelong interest in manga, beginning at least as early as junior high. Even while working as an animator, he continued to draw manga. He did manga tie-ins for some of the films and series he was involved in at Toy and after he left. He has published manga with his own stories under pseudonyms. For our purposes today, three of his manga are the most important because they eventually became the bases for films. Nausicaa Valley of the Wind, which inspired 1984's Nausicaa Valley of the Wind, as we'll discuss in just a minute. The Age of the Flying Beast, which inspired 1992's Porco Rosso. Fun fact, Porco Rosso began as a 45-minute in-flight film for Japan Airlines before it became a full-length theatrical release. And The Wind Rises, a fictionalized biography of Jiro Horokoshi that inspired 2013's The Wind Rises. There are several other Studio Ghibli films directed by other members of the staff inspired by manga written by people outside of the studio. 1991's Only Yesterday is based on the manga Only Yesterday by Hotaro Okamoto and Yuko Tone. 1995's Whisper of the Heart is based on the manga Whisper of the Heart by Aoi Hiragi. 1999's My Neighbors the Yamadas is based on the manga Nonochan by Hisaichi Ishii. The Cat Returns is based on The Cat Returns, again by Aoi Hiragi. It's the same mangaka who wrote The Whisper of the Heart. A bit of a sequel, sort of, or at least a follow-up. And 2011's From Up on Poppy Hill directed by Miyazaki's son, Goro Miyazaki, is based on the manga From Up on Poppy Hill, written by Tetsuro Sayama and illustrated by Chizuru Takahashi. Unfortunately, I believe The Cat Returns is the only one of these manga translated into English. Please correct me on the website or Blue Sky if I'm wrong, and I'll happily post a correction and a link on the episode page. There is a link to purchase Baron, The Cat Returns, I can't find the translator's name in the publisher's information. Shame on Viz Media. Please credit your translators. Let me talk for just a minute about Nausicaa Valley of the Wind. It is probably Miyazaki's most famous manga, and it's a work some critics regard as his magnum opus. Again, technically speaking, Nausicaa is not a Studio Ghibli film, but... Here's the setup for Nausicaa, both manga and film. 
In the 30th century, a handful of scattered human civilizations attempt to survive on the edges of the environmental destruction left behind by the seven days of fire a thousand years before. There's a toxic jungle or a sea of corruption, depending on the translation, that's full of giant insects, especially the Omu, and the sea of corruption constantly extends its borders. 16-year-old Nausicaa, princess of the Valley of the Wind, is one of the only humans who thinks the creatures of the Sea of Corruption and humans can learn to live together. The action of Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind centers on Nausicaa's attempts to prevent war between the surviving humans and to prevent the humans and insects from destroying each other. Miyazaki began publishing installments of Nausicaa in 1982. By the time he had finished just two of the manga's eventual seven chapters, the magazine editors were pushing him to consider an anime adaptation. The film Nausicaa was completed in 1984, almost a full decade before Miyazaki actually finished the story. The movie ends with an almost messianic, messiah-like or even Christ-like, Nausicaa, sacrificing herself to save the Omu and then being resurrected with their assistance. It's an extremely hopeful ending and completely at odds with where Miyazaki eventually took the manga. I cannot really do the manga justice without spoiling it, but I'll end with two quotes that give you some idea where Miyazaki takes the story. The climax isn't a fight scene, but something of a high-stakes philosophical debate. Nausicaa's foe says to her, You are a dangerous darkness. Life is light. And Nausicaa responds, You are wrong. Life is the light that shines in the darkness. Why didn't they realize, she asks, that both purity and corruption are the very stuff of life? Some of Ghibli's movies come from Japanese novels, although, honestly, fewer than I was expecting when I started this project. I think the most notable example is 1989's Kiki's Delivery Service, directed by Miyazaki and based on the book by Eiko Kadano. Since that book is our focus text, I'll turn back to it in greater detail at the end of the episode. The other two examples are 1988's Grave of the Fireflies, based on the partly autobiographical novel by Akiyuki Nosaka, and 1993's Ocean Waves, based on the novel by Saeko Himuro. Grave of the Fireflies has been translated by James R. Abrams, although it's hard to track down and I wish someone would re-release it. Ocean Waves has not been translated into English to the best of my knowledge. I suppose you could throw in 2013's The Tale of Princess Kaguya as a fourth example of a Studio Ghibli movie from a Japanese literary source. The Tale of Princess Kaguya is based on one of Japan's oldest written folk tales, The Tale of the Bamboo Cutter. You can find that story in a lot of places. We covered it in our episode about Japanese science fiction, that story of a princess born from a bamboo stalk who must eventually return to her people on the moon. Several of Studio Ghibli's films come from Western novels, all children's books. One film comes from the work of an American writer, 2006's Tales of Earthsea is a hodgepodge of Earthsea tales by Ursula K. Le Guin. But most of the Western novels are British. 2010's Arietti is adapted from Mary Norton's The Borrowers. 2014's When Marnie Was There is adapted from Joan Robinson's novel of the same title. 2020's much denigrated CGI, Earwig and the Witch, directed by Goro Miyazaki is adapted from Diana Wynne-Jones' novel of the same title. But by far the most successful of Studio Ghibli's films from Western sources is 2004's Howl's Moving Castle, directed by Hayao Miyazaki from another Diana Wynne-Jones novel, Howl's Moving Castle. Jones is maybe best known for The Chronicles of Crestomancy. She's much better known in the UK than in the rest of the English-speaking world. Jones was born in 1934, died in 2011, and published Howl's Moving Castle in 1986. Howl has two loosely related sequels, Castle in the Air, 
published in 1990, and The House of Many Ways, published in 2008. Miyazaki's movie follows the rough outlines of the novel. Sophie Hatter is a young woman with an old soul making hats in her family's hat shop. The Witch of the Waste curses her, turning her into an elderly woman, and part of the curse is that Sophie can't tell anyone. Sophie seeks out help from the wizard Howell, who lives in a moving castle. There are several notable details in the novel that Miyazaki omits. In a lot of ways, these details make Jones's story richer, certainly more coherent, although not necessarily any more meaningful. For example, in the novel, Sophie herself has magic, although she doesn't know it. She can talk life into objects. You can kind of see that in the film. It makes some parts of the movie make more sense. It explains how she's able to have a relationship with an animated scarecrow named Turniphead. It suggests explanations for how she's eventually able to, spoiler, save the fire demon Calcifer. In the novel, Sophie's sisters play a much bigger role. Because they play a bigger role, Turniphead and the wizard Suleiman get happier endings. You can make inferences about what that means. I should clarify that in the novel, Suleiman is a man and not a woman as portrayed in the film. And the endings of the book and film are completely different. In the novel, the war is more in the background, and the final confrontation is with the Witch of the Waste. Taking a look at these changes helps us to paint a picture of the ways that Miyazaki adapts his material. The story is more of a vessel he fills a palette he paints with. Miyazaki is more interested in A, the meaning of the story, B, the themes that are important to him within the story, and C, the aesthetics of the story. Then he is with a completely coherent tale with neatly tied up loose ends or fidelity to an author's work. Jones liked what Miyazaki did with her story or at least she did by the time she got around to writing about it in an author's introduction. Movies are always different, she noted in one interview. When she was asked about Miyazaki's film, she noted two surprises. She was surprised by Miyazaki's moving castle. She had not thought about the castle having feet. In her imagination, the castle was more like a hovercraft. And she considered Miyazaki's versions of her characters gentler and more noble. Some of Ghibli's most original films come straight and unfiltered from Miyazaki's imagination. But it's still possible to identify, let's call them, inspirations for some of his stories. This is where we can get most invested in literature. Miyazaki conceived 1986's Castle in the Sky as a kind of boy's adventure story. It has a bit of Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels. That's one of Miyazaki's childhood favorites. Other boy's adventure stories like Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. 1988's My Neighbor Totoro is extremely original. I think the biggest inspiration was probably Miyazaki's own life. Totoro is set in 1950s Japan. A university professor moves his 10 and 4-year-old daughters to an old house in rural Tokorizawa, not far from Tokyo, to be closer to where their mother is hospitalized for a long-term illness. Remember that Miyazaki was born in 1941, so he would have been about 10 years old at about the same point in history. The girls gradually discover that their house and the forest nearby are home to magical spirits like soot sprites and, more importantly, a giant Totoro. Totoro is four-year-old May's name for the forest spirit who reminds her of the troll, and troll is a foreign word she can't pronounce, from her storybook of the Billy Goat's Gruff. The story is divided between magical interludes and the very real details of 10-year-old Satsuki learning to manage as woman of the house in her mother's absence. And both of the girls have to deal with their fear about their mother's illness. There are some minor literary antecedents, predecessors, inspirations at work in Totoro. For example, 
May crawls through a hole to discover Totoro in a scene that looks like something out of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Critics have observed echoes of the stories that Miyazaki adapted during the 1970s, like Johanna Spiri's Heidi and Ellen Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables. The story also draws a great deal from the animistic Shinto religion. But as I mentioned, critics like Susan Napier see a lot of Miyazaki's own childhood in the story. There is, of course, a mother with a long-term illness. As we mentioned earlier, Miyazaki's mother suffered from tuberculosis, although she eventually recovered. The film never explicitly identifies the mother's illness as tuberculosis, but the later novelization does. And the film shows the two little girls' terror that their mother may die. Miyazaki clearly saw himself in Satsuki, who tries so hard to make up for her mother's absence. Her efforts make her almost implausibly good. Toshio Suzuki tried to insist to Miyazaki that there couldn't be a kid as good as Satsuki. Miyazaki was furious with him. She did exist, he told Suzuki. That was me. What about Princess Mononoke? Miyazaki cherished a dream of animating a 13th century essay on Mujo, the Buddhist concept of impermanence, written by a bureaucrat turned hermit named Kamo no Chome. Even Miyazaki realized that this essay, the Hojiki, probably wasn't the ideal source for an animated movie, or even that the novel that inspired his interest in the Hojiki, called the Hokojokiden by Yoshie Hota, would not make a great animated film. I'm pretty sure that novel has not been translated either. But Susan Napier thinks it's likely that the medieval text was part of the inspiration behind the medieval setting of 1997's Princess Mononoke. She also attributes that film's anti-war message, maybe the strongest in any Miyazaki film, to contemporary events. For example, Princess Mononoke debuted two years after the Aum Shinrikyo attack on the Tokyo subway that we discussed in the last episode. For 2000 Spirited Away, Miyazaki first considered Sachiko Kashiwaba's The Marvelous Village Veiled in Mist. You can learn more about Kashiwaba in our episode about Japanese children's literature. The Marvelous Village Veiled in Mist was Kashiwaba's first novel. It was translated into English or Japanese, English language learners, by Christopher Holmes. It's a little tricky to get your hands on, but it is possible. Like Spirited Away, Kashiwaba's story revolves around a lazy little girl forced to work in a magical place. This time, it's a village populated by people from magical families. Both stories involve a lot of character growth, but the similarities more or less end there. There's also an iconic scene in Spirited Away where the heroine, Chihiro, takes a train journey. Miyazaki is especially proud of this scene. It was inspired by one of his favorite stories from modern Japanese children's literature, Kenji Miyazawa's Night on the Milky Way Train. That story has been translated into English many times and under several titles. I think I have used several different titles during the course of this podcast, Night on the Milky Way Train is the story of a lonely and bullied little boy who finds himself and a friend on a steam train journey through the galaxy's stars. And I think we'll be covering Kenji Miyazawa in our next episode. 2008's Ponyo is the story of a fish who wants to become a human little girl against the wishes of her grouchy environmentalist wizard father. You might already recognize echoes of a famous Hans Christian Andersen story, The Little Mermaid. Even though Miyazaki's story shares the setup for Andersen's tale, the rest of the story is all his own. Susan Napier also sees elements of William Shakespeare's play The Tempest about a sorcerer and his daughter stranded on a tropical island. 2023's The Boy and the Heron is an interesting case, and there are no spoilers here, so don't worry. The Japanese title translates as How Do You Live, also the title of a popular and important Japanese children's book by Genzaburo Yoshino from the 1930s, and that book is still widely read today. We talked about it briefly in our episode about Japanese children's literature. 
The plot is pretty episodic. It's about a 15-year-old Tokyo schoolboy named Copper and his adventures with a close-knit group of friends. Except it's Japan in the 1930s, so they're navigating a culture under growing nationalism, even though the author never says so explicitly. For years, people inside and outside of Japan assumed that a movie called How Do You Live would be based on the book How Do You Live, or as English translator Bruno Navaski worded it, that the movie would be at least, quote, the story of a boy who reads the book. In fact, one of the most interesting English language resources on the book is a Penguin Press article, now incorrectly titled, How a Once Banned Japanese Children's Book Became a Classic and the Next Studio Ghibli Film. Note that Penguin is the UK publisher of the translation. The article explains that Genzoburo Yoshino, the author, spent 18 months in prison in the early 1930s for his involvement with socialism. When he got out, he was recruited to work on an ethics textbook for the Japan Young People's Library. But, again, it was Japan in the early 1930s, so the publisher suggests he produce a novel instead. It helped the book fly under the radar, By 1942, though, the book was taken out of circulation, and when it went into print again in 1945, it had been censored by Americans for its criticism of capitalism. It was several years before it again appeared in its original form. Today, How Do You Live is an essential part of a Japanese classical arts education. Back to Ghibli. So the studio announced that there would be a film titled after this well-known novel. Imagine people's consternation when Ghibli producer Toshio Suzuki explained in June, just a month before the movie's theatrical release in Japan, that the book and the film, quote, have absolutely nothing to do with each other, and that Miyazaki had simply been inspired by the title. In fact, the only reference to the book in the film is a copy of the book the protagonist finds that his mother had intended as a gift when he is older. How's that for ambiguous wording that avoids spoilers? Instead, the movie is, like Spirited Away, like Princess Mononoke, a more or less original creation of Miyazaki's imagination. Before we move on, let me mention just one more Studio Ghibli original, one of my favorites, the only original story, not by Hayao Miyazaki, 1994's Palm Poco, written and directed by Isao Takahata. Palm Poco is another Ghibli environmental fable, this time centering on transforming tanuki, or raccoon dogs of Japanese myth. Both poignant and hilarious, this highly original film is maybe Ghibli's most characteristically Japanese movie, and it's not to be missed. Now, let us finally turn to Kiki's Delivery Service. The novel Kiki was written by author Eiko Cardinal. Eiko Cardinal was born in Tokyo in 1935. She lost her mother in 1940. After her father went to fight in the Pacific War, she was evacuated to Yamagata Prefecture in northern Japan. Cardinal studied American literature at the prestigious Waseda University and then went to work at a publisher. After she married, Cardinal went with her husband to Sao Paulo, Brazil. While there, she traveled and worked in radio broadcasting for members of the Japanese diaspora living in Brazil. Cardinal published her first book in 1970. Since then, she has published about 250 titles, mostly picture books. And that doesn't include her translations of foreign titles into Japanese, She has more than 100 translations to her name as well. I wish more of her work had been translated into English, but I at least had access to summaries. I especially enjoyed a summary of 1979's picture book, A Husband for Nessie. In A Husband for Nessie, a northern Japanese sea monster, Zabu, goes on a quest to marry the Loch Ness Monster. Kadano tells the story behind Kiki's delivery service in an author's note in the newest English translation. Kiki's delivery service was inspired by one of my daughter's drawings. It was a picture of a witch flying through the sky listening to a radio. Musical notes danced around her, 
They were beautiful images, and I felt like there was a story there. I chose to make the protagonist witch a 12-year-old, just like my daughter at the time. That's how Kiki's Delivery Service got its start. Cardinal published the novel Kiki's Delivery Service in 1985. In case you aren't familiar with Kiki, let me provide a short overview of the plot that covers both versions of the story. Kiki lives in the countryside, the youngest in a long line of witches. Many magical skills have been lost over time. Kiki's only magical ability is flying on her broomstick. Now that Kiki has turned 13, tradition dictates that she should leave home and make her own way living somewhere new. On the night of the full moon, she flies away with a radio and her talking black cat, Gigi. She settles in a larger town and starts her own flying delivery service. I wrote a review of Kiki's Delivery Service for the Asian Review of Books when it was last translated into English. Since English language readers were more likely to be familiar with Miyazaki's interpretation of Kiki, I spent a good bit of time celebrating what's different about Kadano's story. For one, Kadano's version of the story is much more of a classic episodic coming-of-age story. Kiki faces a new, discreet challenge she must overcome in each chapter. She grows a little each time she solves a problem, and the novel brings her character arc to a satisfying conclusion. She has to play flying lifeguard at a beach, fix the broken-down clock during New Year's celebrations, save a band performance— none of which makes it into the film. In my favorite episode, Kiki solves the boat captain's problem. She saves the captain by delivering the captain's eccentric mother's stomach scarves to the boat. Something was wrong with the boat. It used to go putt-putt, and now it goes pukat, pukat, and the stomach scarves save the day. The book is also funnier than the film, by the way. Kadano's Kiki is also more optimistic and resilient than Miyazaki's. The book doesn't include long melancholies and a loss of self-confidence that almost costs Kiki her magic. Earlier in the episode, I used Howl's Moving Castle to illustrate the ways Miyazaki adapts his material. Even though Kiki is probably truer to its source story than Howl, Miyazaki's interests are the same. He cares about the meaning of the story and the themes that are most important to him. In this case, Miyazaki pulls out two themes, or at least two motifs, that already exist in Kadano's story, everyday magic and powerful women. In both versions, Kiki's magic isn't really what makes her special. As Kadano puts it, Kiki's magic is, quote, as close to normal as possible. She's a witch but she's also a perfectly ordinary girl with the same worries, disappointments, and joys as anyone else. Kadano wanted Kiki to have just enough magic to make her interesting, but not enough to make her so very different. Kadano's Kiki is mostly a cheerful and ingenious young teenager. It is diligence, hard work, and strength of character that make her special. And these are the kinds of traits that Miyazaki routinely highlights in his heroes and heroines. When characters lack them, like Spirited Away's Chihiro, Miyazaki forces them to learn. The women in Kiki are powerful in a multitude of ways. Kiki is, of course, a witch, as is her mother. There's the bakery owner, Osono, who takes Kiki in and stands out as a phenomenal wife and mother and community member. There is a painter who helps Kiki discover something beautiful in herself. There are even more powerful women in the book than there are in the film, and they all participate in the community in ways that are almost subversive. As scholar Kayoko Fujimori explains, Kiki, quote, can be considered to have been constructed to portray the ways women work and the ways women meet and connect through their work. The power these women have means that they might, quote, to some extent be considered witches too. That's a motif that likely appealed to Miyazaki. Remember that almost all of his films include at least one powerful female character, even when they are morally ambiguous, like Spirited Away's Yubaba or Princess Mononoke's Lady Eboshi, 
there is something in them to be admired. I've read reports that Kadano was initially unhappy with the film's script. So unhappy that Miyazaki and Toshio Suzuki struggled to convince her to give the script a go-ahead. By the time she was interviewed for the book's new English translation in 2020, she told the interviewer, quote, I basically believe that whenever something is made into a movie, it becomes a different work from the original. At the time, I asked that the title and the story's world be kept and that Kiki's personality also align with how she is in the novel. Having read the book and seen the film, I think those two goals were fairly achieved. English speakers only have access to one volume of Kiki's stories. Kiki is a series with eight sequels, none of which are available in English, which is a real shame. Maybe we can successfully clamor for more. By the way, the most recent sequel was published last year in 2022. Kadano is in her late 80s. In the remaining volumes, Kiki and her best male friend Tombo fall in love, they marry, and they have two children of their own. Eventually, the children turn 13 and leave home in search of magic of their own. We've talked about a lot of books and films today, so I guess I'll give a two-way plug. Consider watching Studio Ghibli films and reading the books that inspire them because they are great stories. The books are not only examples of Japanese literature, but of the kinds of tales from overseas that Japanese people have enjoyed. And the films are some of the highest grossing of all time in Japan. Again, they represent the kinds of stories with wide appeal to Japanese readers and viewers. Plus, these are stories that have been cherished by people all over the world, myself included. Today, I've been reading from Kiki's Delivery Service by Eiko Kadano, translated by Emily Balistrieri. You can find a list of all the books we've mentioned in this episode on the episode page. Buy your books from ourbookshop.org to support the podcast. And I've recently added a holiday gift guide, so check that out too. You can support the podcast by leaving a review on your podcast app of choice. The very best way to support Read Japanese Literature is through Patreon for as little as $3 a month. Remember that Patreon supporters get early access and bonus content for every episode, as well as updates on new English language releases of Japanese literature. Thank you so much to all our supporters, and a special thank you to our new Patreon supporters, Kaon and Jonathan. Find out how you can join them at patreon.com slash literature. We'd love to hear from you about the podcast. There are so many ways to stay in touch through the website, bluesky at readjapaneselit.bsky.social, Instagram at readjapaneselit, we're on YouTube slash at readjapaneseliterature. Thank you to the Japanese Literature Group on Goodreads and to the Japanese Literature Communities on Blue Sky and Twitter. And thank you as always to producer Kime for today's music at Kime Music and KimeMusic.com.